Oh, what's the matter, my child? I'm doing my homework, Lolo, in mathematics about the cubic equation, and it's giving me a hard time understanding it. Well, learning is easy if you love the topic, but loving something or someone, you must first know about their past so you can relate to them. Well, do you know the history of the cubic equation, Lolo? You bet I do. But I'm way too old to tell you the whole story though, so I have my friends here to narrate it to you. Are you ready to go back to the past? Oh yeah! It's the 16th century. It is widely considered to be one of the pivotal centuries in human history, a time when the overall organization and structure of human society went through a fundamental change. It was the high point of a larger historical period known as the Renaissance, which lasted from the late 14th century up until the 16th century. It was called the Renaissance because Europe saw a rebirth of learning, arts, and culture which had not been seen since the splendor of the Greek and Roman emperors of a thousand years past. This rebirth was encouraged by the rise of universities, the creation of the first printing press in 1435, which allowed book publication to flourish, and the widespread support for the arts by wealthy patrons. But more than a rebirth occurred in Europe in the 16th century. Expanding trade created wealth and new industry, helping to fuel the growth of the middle class. Religious controversies sparked war and contributed to the strength and independence of nations throughout Europe. And the invention of new technologies revolutionized agriculture and industry, allowing for greater population growth. During this time, mathematicians would arrange public competitions. They would challenge each other to solve mathematical problems at this time. Those who won these tournaments were well known and had an easy time seeking employment. As a result, mathematicians kept their knowledge hidden in order to gain competitive advantage. This gets us to the type of issue that was prevalent at this time. It entails the solution to the cubic equations or equations of the form ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. Many mathematicians thought that this problem had no general solution. This connects us to Cipion del Ferro, a student at Bologna University. He solved what were known as the pressed cubic equations or equations of the form dq plus pt plus q equals zero. Of course, he kept the solution in secret, but the Ferro revealed the solution to his student Antonio Fior on his deathbed. Fior excelled in competitions solving the pressed cubics thanks to this formula. Fior was skeptical when another mathematician in the person of Nicola Tartaglia claimed to be more skilled at addressing these kinds of problems. As a result, Fior challenged Tartaglia to a public contest, not in an arm wrestling fight, but a battle of wits, where they set math problems for each other to solve. Tartaglia challenged Fior with a cubic equation that could not be solved using the Del Ferro method. Tartaglia easily won the challenge since he had found out a solution to the general depressed cubic problem on his own. Fior was humiliated by his loss and fled, never to be seen again. Hirolamo Cardano, as a role model for today's mathematicians, was not the finest. He was a rat or a scoundrel in his previous existence. Cardano was impressed and intrigued by Tartaglia's ability to solve these problems, so he requested for the solution. Tartaglia declined, protecting his precious formula. However, Cardano persisted until Tartaglia agreed to provide the formula on the condition that Cardano will never publish it or write it down in any form other than the code. Cardano sent 
a contract prepared by Tartaglia agreeing not to reveal the solution. Cardano was able to obtain two more solutions using the solution but he was unable to publish them due to the usage of Tartaglia's formula. Cardano was impatient as he awaited Tartaglia's solution to be published so he could publish his without breaking the contract. Cardano looked into the notion that Tartaglia was not the first to discover the formula for the cubic equation. He discovered evidences of Scipion del Ferro's original solution and determined that his contract was no longer legitimate. Cardano released Artis Magne, which includes Tartaglia's solution. Tartaglia was enraged by Cardano's action and spent the rest of his life attempting to discredit him. Tartaglia died penniless and unknown despite his significant achievements with the cubic equations. So that's it for the 16th century trivia. Whoa! It's quite intriguing story, no? I'm starting to love math knowing its interesting history. Wait! There's more! There are other important 16th century discoveries that occurred during the late 15th and early 16th century. Did you know that an Italian Franciscan friar could look up Pasholi, publish a book on arithmetic, geometry, and bookkeeping which became quite popular for mathematical puzzles? It contained and later he is known to be the father of accounting. The book also introduced symbols for plus and minus for the first time in a printed book. Also, during this time, the mathematician Robert Record wrote a book called The Western of Wheat to teach English students algebra. But he was getting tired of writing the words is equal to over and over. His solution, he replaced those words with two parallel horizontal line segments because the way he saw it, no two things can be more equal. Could he have used four line segments instead of two? Of course, could he have used vertical line segments? In fact, some people did. There is no reason why the equal sign had to look the way it does today. At some point, it just got on sort of like a man. More and more mathematicians began to use it. And eventually, it became a standard symbol for equality. Sometimes, as Record himself noted about his equal sign, there is an apt conformity between the symbol and what it represents. Another example of that is the plus sign for addition which originated from a condensing of the Latin word at meaning and. Sometimes, however, the choice of symbol is more arbitrary, such as when a mathematician named Christian Krom introduced the exclamation mark for factorials just because he needed a shorthand for expressions like this. In fact, all of these symbols were invented or adapted by mathematicians who wanted to avoid repeating themselves or having to use a lot of words to write out mathematical ideas. Many of these symbols used in mathematics are letters, usually from the Latin alphabet or Greek. Characters are often found representing quantities that are unknown and the relationship between variables. They also stand in for specific numbers that show up frequently but could be cumbersome or impossible to fully write out in decimal form. Steps of numbers and whole equations can be represented with letters too. Other symbols are used to represent operations. Some of these are especially valuable as shorthand because they condense repeated operations into a single expression. The repeated addition of the same number is abbreviated with a multiplication sign so it doesn't take up more space than it has to. A number multiplied by itself is indicated with an exponent that tells you how many times to repeat the operation. And a long string of sequential terms added together is collapsed into a capital sigma. These symbols shorten lengthy calculations to smaller terms that are much easier to manipulate. Understanding them is a matter of memorizing what they mean and applying them in different contexts until they stick as with any language. Now, who says math isn't exciting? Wow! Indeed, the history of mathematical concepts and notations are so captivating. I hope you learned to love math as much as I did. 
now that's it for today Apo because it's already dark outside and it's time for you to bed. See you in another episode of Alamath. Good night! Tag glow so